this is Mitski and welcome to Artists in Residence AAA. So today, myself and my producer, Patrick Highland, are going to go over some of the tracks we created together. And we're gonna talk about our production process, our creative process. And we're gonna give you an insight into how it all comes together. This is Artist in Residence, Triple A with me, Mitski, on Six Music. All of our love, filling all of our room, your low warm voice. Curses as you find the string to strike within me that rings out a note heard in heaven. Okay, so I'm Mitski. This is Patrick Highland, my producer. He produced all but one of my albums. So let's talk about Heaven first. Heaven, heaven. We'll both, here, we'll both hold <laughs> guitars. So. Sorry, are we jamming? <laughs> we might be jamming. Uh, I hate jamming. I've heard of that. I remember when I first wrote it, it didn't have this, the country swing that it does now. Um, it was... All of our love. Do -do 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 -do. Just like standard, standard Mitski fare. <laughs> um, and then that just didn't feel right and it kind of sat for a while. And then we demoed the swinged, the swung version. Yeah. Yeah. So that early demo was quite close to the way you hear it mm -hmm. on the land, but the strings were all fake. <laughs> yeah. Because it was just you and I, mm -hmm. so it was keyboard strings. Yeah. The strings at the end was quite, as you hear it on the album, was quite close to what you wrote. Yeah. And we basically asked Drew Erickson, the um, orchestrator who worked on The Land Is Inhospitable, we basically presented him with the MIDI string and was like, just do this, but with real instruments. Yeah. And then he, all the stuff in the verses, he wrote all these saxophones and things. Oh, and yeah. So all Drew. Cheers. Yeah. Which I think is really beautiful. And, and then in the end, I remember we had, we were trying to figure out the sound of the orchestra at the end. So we were trying to decide whether to make it sound bigger, like a big Hollywood film score, or like yeah. go the other route and just... Make it more chambery. Yeah, more chambery. And I remember thinking, okay, instead of doing like Los Angeles 60s Wrecking Crew type like Mm -hmm. Big smooth. I wanted to do like um, Miss Bennett and Mr. Darcy at the country <laughs> ball. <laughs> we, yeah, because it, well, and it's so like as we're getting there, we have like all this stuff. Yeah. And it's like. Yeah, it's really and washy and dreamy. And there's sort of, you can't get bigger than that. Mm -hmm. It has to collapse down. Mm -hmm. And my notes for Drew on the end was, I kept talking about the last shot in Blue Velvet. Oh, yeah. Play it, play it. The play fake it. birds. <laughs> studio at Sunset Sound when we were recording the orchestra, they were having so much 
trouble with the time. Yeah, but I was like, there's a weird phrase in there. No, but it's not though. I was like, it's a waltz. It's a waltz. Like mm -hmm. it's just one. Dun, 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 because it's a country ball. Because it's Miss. Yeah. Mister Darcy. There is a, a a phrase that's a little hard to count, even though it's just in waltz time. Why? Because the, the phrase starts on two. We don't all have galaxy brains. <laughs> <laughs> there's also... The keyboard that's doing the melody over on the left side is also from the original demo. Our demo had the da 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 but then during our first session the drummer didn't do it and then we had the drummer re-record because we ended up realizing we really want yeah that. it's kind of the nashville people kind of just like smoothed over it and then yeah i think we recut this in mm -hmm. and i think i played something on it and then Fats, Fats's part, or no, yeah, the string part. What did we do on MIDI first? I wrote a MIDI part. Da, 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 da. Yeah, that came, that's all you. Yeah. That came from your original. But what did I play for the MIDI? Was that also strings when I played it? I feel I, like it was keys or something. Yeah, it was the organ yeah. in Philly. And then Fats came in, did this. Yeah. Yeah, I just can't say enough good things about all of all this beautiful work that Drew and the folks mm -hmm. in the string section did and the wind section. It's pretty close to what the original sounded like. Just like more competent <laughs> bass and drums. <laughs> Rather than like, you and me, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. Um, that sound and just like being so happy mm. that these real professionals were playing our music. <laughs> <laughs> this song, I wanted to write a genuinely romantic song. What did you think about the demo when I first presented it to you? Moment of truth. Yeah, I felt like it was one of your strongest songs. It was a bit <laughs> weird that we just sort of put it away for yeah, a couple years. We, it just didn't fit in any album, I think. The Land, the album The Land, I think like half of it is just a collection of songs we had but didn't fit on Laurel Hill. A general influence for the album, but maybe particularly for this one, is like Patsy Cline, the, that era of country music yeah. where it's just like crooning and beautiful. Crazy. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. The, the kind of Columbia, Quonset mm -hmm. sound, and I feel like a lot of records around that time that Willie Nelson wrote, but mm -hmm. maybe didn't perform on. Yeah, because I think Willie Nelson wrote a lot of Patsy Cline's yeah. big songs. You'd love me as long as you want it. Okay, yes, so let's do Star next because I already know what I want to say about it. And then someday you'd leave me for somebody new. I wrote Star a long, long time ago when we were out at South By. My friend Tyler was letting us stay at their house and I had an acoustic guitar and I was outside in the yard and I started, I don't know, writing this song. And it was so long ago, I can't remember how I first started thinking about the song, but I started thinking about the fact that starlight that we see now is not necessarily light from stars that currently exist. Currently is kind of like a weird world when we're talking about mm -hmm. space time, but we're often seeing the light of dead stars. Remember when we met We acted like two fools We were so glad And I was just pondering that 
that fact, I guess. And I first started, when I first started writing it, it was not like the, the record whatsoever, other than like the melody and the lyrics. At first it was like, remember when we met, we acted like two fools. It wasn't this fast, but I'm rushing through it because it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what I said when you brought it in. Yeah, exactly. And so it's that's why we were boring. like really touching. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and then I think we recorded that version, but we quickly realized, well, not quickly, it took a while, but we realized that was just too many chords. Yeah, and even like when we were doing Heaven, we tried a version that was like... Yeah. But it was like... Just felt off. It, it was... When you play it like that, it's too cutesy. Right, a little too twee. It sounds like it's from a, like a French film in the, from the 40s or something. Mm -hmm. It's like... With umbrellas, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's too, like, happy-go-lucky. It, yeah. It didn't really capture it. But then also just doing, like... Yes. Was a bit monotone or yeah. something. So then we thought, okay, how about, how about if we start with a drone? Yeah. I mean, this track is honestly all you. This is perhaps your masterpiece, <laughs> I would say. I would say. Uh, I don't know about that. So we started it with... Just trying to do something simpler. And I was um, trying to basically just cop the sound of like Scott Walker and mm -hmm. Angela Morley. Mm -hmm. There's some BBC history for you, Angela Morley. Um, and just all the amazing arrangements that they did together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it goes without saying that like Drew Erickson once again yeah. did some amazing although i will say i remember we went back and forth with drew erickson because in the beginning um he, he sent just like so much yeah <laughs> it was yeah his first draft was kind he of he got like, really excited which i really i i i I'm glad he was excited to do this, yeah. but it was like... Yeah, it was like, okay, well, let's save that energy for the end. <laughs> Instead of just coming in hot. Yeah. With, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I did the, the Terry Riley yeah, stuff. Yeah, I love that. And it was so excruciating because... <laughs> Because it was like note by note punching it in. Yeah. I just knew I wanted something in there that kind of. Yeah. I could just listen to it. This is my favorite part, honestly. But yeah, I was like trying to, just really trying to copy Rainbow and Curved Air, the yeah. Terry Riley piece. Terry Riley was uh, arguably the father of minimalism, mm -hmm. uh, although I, he probably doesn't like that term because nobody likes the things. Nobody that... likes to be categorized. But I mean, I guess in pop culture, the Who wrote Bob O'Reilly with Terry O'Reilly. Not maybe not wrote the entire song, but like the arrangement in the beginning. Yeah. Well, like what I was trying to do here, they were trying to rip off Rainbow and Curved yeah. Air. <laughs> a Rainbow and Curved Air is probably one of the most ripped off pieces of mm -hmm. art music. Uh, Let's not use the words ripped off because <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble, but... <laughs> the stuff I was trying to draw in here is mostly from the 60s. It just gets increasingly glitchy. <gasps> 
<laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> it gets bigger. <gasps> I love this so much. Yeah, there's some... Dynamics! There's there's some Pat Metheny in there. Yeah. Some <laughs> electric counterpoint stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, like, have this sort of persisting chaotic mm -hmm. ostinato that mm -hmm. offsets how kind of restrained the track is up until that point and then i love the point where it gets even louder you can't you think it can't possibly <laughs> get louder <laughs> yeah. oh another favorite part is when the drums first come in yeah and this was a funny one doing it with ross the drummer because i was just like it's truly just like enough, like it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You get to do one fill when you come in. It's really it's disappointing just, for drummers, but yeah, they, they, sometimes a drummer has to take one for the team. He smashed it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if you will. Yeah, I mean, which I totally, this is totally taken from the Walker Brothers. Yeah. Um, a lot of their drum parts are just like a, mm -hmm. kind of a loop. unmute everything because I want to hear when the drums come in in the context of everything because you don't think drums are going to come in you think oh it's a drone song and then yes. <laughs> you don't have to tell me it's really good. It's very, what, yeah. what instrument is it? That's a Moog. That's a very... Very Moog, isn't it? It's very Moog. It's very Pink Floyd, isn't it? Sounds mm -hmm. like uh, all the drones on Wish You Were Here. Mm -hmm. The idea was that the bass synths are just one pitch until the last chorus, right? When, then... when it ascends, yeah. Love it. Love it. So at that point, we're about two minutes into the song, and it's just been one note. And so then it's when about, it... It's about a third of the way in. But usually, I don't know, two-thirds of the way into a pop song, like a three- to four-minute pop song, is when you got to change something up. Yeah. But so the idea was that... You're thinking that bass won't change. Because you're like... Yeah. If, okay, this is if it. If it was going to change, it would have happened by yeah. now. Yeah. So it adds a real mm -hmm. lift. It's very spacey also. Yeah. I imagine like... <laughs> camera floating in space and then suddenly planets, galaxy. Mm. You're thinking it was this Star Trek Next yeah. Generation <laughs> <laughs> opening title. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I so mean, are you saying it's a... Uh... That's when we say space. <laughs> space. space. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else would add to the song? Pause it, pause it. We yeah, should add this for there. the Terry Riley part. Yeah. Yeah. Terry Riley wishes. Yeah. <laughs> and then the the woodwinds did some really wild, cool stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And there's a really lovely. Um, Was it the trumpet? Well, there's some French horns. Yeah. That are, really nice mm. French horn lines. Um. I put in this, it's not real, it's a synthesizer, but these pipe organ parts. Oh, yeah. Which I think... Makes it sound big, because yeah. pipe organs are big. Ugh. And all this is was in there from the beginning, so you can hear how Drew kind of 
built on top of the voicings that I'd done in this. And then I think at the end we also had, I asked you to, um, <laughs> I asked you to, um, at first we just ended it on, on a bang, I think. But they sustain for... Yeah. For Washing Machine Heart, I think for this song, I remember trying to think of my heart pounding and then thinking of when you put shoes in a washing machine, which I don't know if you're supposed to do, but I've done before and I think we all have, so we shouldn't have shame about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it goes, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I wanted to express lyrically. Usually when I write songs, it's lyrics first or lyrics and vocal melody together. I don't really care about chords until like after the singing melody is done because it's always important to me for, be, to me, for people to be able to sing the song without any instrumentation because that's how I started like making up songs to myself and I always kept myself company by singing songs to myself and I never had an instrument for that. So yeah, I just want people to be able to sing it without any accompaniment. I first wrote it on guitar, but I can't remember what I, it was like, uh, uh, fudge, t no swearing, BBC. Um, I think they're allowing fudge now. I they're allowing that. fudge? <laughs> nice. Um, no, stop it. <laughs> Just, <laughs> no, please, stop it, stop it. I need to remember. Um, oh, 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 oh. I don't remember, but I wrote it on guitar, um, and it was it was just like that. It was like. Anyway, I can't. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry to everybody. I was quite proud of the melody because it was so different. Yeah. Well, the th the thing that people might not know is that most of your most popular songs are songs that you wanted to cut from their respective albums. Did I want to cut this one? Yeah, so this was like towards the end of Be the Cowboy. And as we were finishing the album, you were like, yeah, I don't really know about this one. I, I kind of want to cut it. And I was mm. like, no, I think we should keep it on. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like the moment history splits in two. <laughs> yeah. So we recorded the... Yes, this was fun. We, we found like surfaces in the studio to bang, essentially. Yeah, it was like the floor. Yeah. And some road cases and yeah, we, boxes and stuff. That and we were, were just like, the two of us with mm -hmm. one mic was like, dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Yeah. This, oh, yeah. Is, this, is, <laughs> this is fun. Well, it's tell, <laughs> taking me back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we had that, and then you had the the chords, chords and the so top one, yeah. Just brought in the a very simple bass. Yeah, I remember when you first brought up this sound. I was like, this sound, <laughs> <laughs> but it grew on me. But it's just a weird, unexpected sound. Yeah, I think I was trying to go for like a Prince type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And then I played some drums on it. Yes, this was the album where you were playing a lot of drums. Which is, the drums are super simple because mm -hmm. I'm not good at drums. <laughs> You're but better than me, so. I also think... When 
we heard that, we were like, okay, there's something mm -hmm. here. It's not completely rote. There's like, there's something to juxtaposing the like kind of 80s dance thing mm -hmm. with this more stately sounding yeah. violin line. Mm -hmm. Toss your dirty shoes in I mean, yeah, this my was the last element. Oh, I sound so young. That's that's the only spot where there's there's some doubles on it. Baby, though I've closed my eyes, I know who you pretend yeah. I am. And then the what is it? Fun fact, the Domiti, at first I was like, I mean, it didn't end up being this, but I wanted to do... I was being very silly. I wanted to do um, a melody using... It's not that funny. Why are you laughing? Because I don't know where this is going. <laughs> I wanted to do um, like a Solfage-based lyric, and I was really, really trying to figure out a way to say miso. Because <laughs> I want... <laughs> Because I wanted to talk about miso soup, but I just, it just didn't, it just didn't. But I was really trying to do like, do miso, miso, can I do miso somewhere? And I'm like, oh, no, I have to give it you up. You were trying to write like a novelty song. Yeah. About <laughs> no, I wasn't. It wasn't a novelty for me. It's very serious for me. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think one of my favorite things about this song is that there isn't that much going on. Like, yeah. there's one keyboard doing the chords, one doing the lead. And maybe that's why I wanted to cut it, because I was like, this is a silly song. Mm. This is not part of my serious album. <laughs> well, and no one, they, they didn't, th like, the label and people, like, no one thought it would do anything because it's so short. I know. <laughs> But there's just let's not talk about label stuff <laughs> because <laughs> we're proponents of like say what you need to say and don't say anymore but I keep getting the criticism of like, your songs are too short. Mm -hmm. Why is it under three minutes? And I'm just like, well, this is what I wanted to say and it's over. Yeah. Let's not add more stuff to it. Yeah, and I think like, yeah, I don't know, like no one's ever gotten bored listening to like a Buzzcock song or something because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you just get it really quickly. Mm -hmm. How does the end go? I haven't listened to this in a long time. I do like that. It's so hard to figure out how to end songs because we're out of the era where like the band would keep playing and then the producer would go, okay. <laughs> and then the yeah. band would keep playing for another 20 minutes, but yeah. no, they wouldn't know. Like, you don't have Barry Gordy just like no. looking at his watch. <laughs> like, like. How do we usually end songs? Well, they just kind of stop. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's how you know it's done. The key to the end of a song is to script it ahead of time, which we haven't done today. The key, to, yeah. <laughs> the key to a good ending, I think, is to put it quite close to the beginning. The key to a good ending is to leave. The yeah. key to a good <laughs> ending is to depart. Which, you know, we have to realize that things can end when we just leave. Conversations can actually end if we just leave the room. Online debates can actually end <laughs> if someone just stops talking. <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's our awkward end, I suppose. Bum, bum.